I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the visit of Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas to the White House for his first meeting with President Donald Trump. And as might be expected, the president said he is ready to help the parties reach a peace agreement. In fact, President Trump suggested it might not be as hard as people think to bring peace to the Israelis and Palestinians. The president said that he believes both parties, Israelis and Palestinians, are now willing to make a peace agreement. Speaking at a lunch for Mr. Abbas, the president said, we need two willing parties. We believe Israel is willing. We believe you're willing. And if you are both willing, we're going to make a deal. Then there was a joint press conference with Mr. Abbas, and the president spoke to the issue. Listen carefully to how Donald Trump describes what the Palestinians must do before, if there's to be any peace agreement. But there can be no lasting peace unless the Palestinian leaders speak in a unified voice against incitement to violate and violence and hate. There's such hatred, but hopefully there won't be such hatred for very long. All children of God must be taught to value and respect human life and condemn all of those who target the innocent. Part of Donald Trump speaking at the joint peace con press conference. I also want to put up a quote that he said at one point during the entire meeting with uh, President Abbas, and it's, any agreement cannot be imposed by the United States or by any other nation. The Palestinians and Israelis must work together to reach an agreement that allows both peoples to live, worship, and thrive and prosper in peace. And that is the crux of the issue, isn't it? Are the Palestinians committed to ending incitement and violence and death and to create a society, a Middle East, where people can thrive and live together? Is there any evidence that the Palestinians are committed to ending murderous acts of terrorism? Well, one voice points out the Palestinian Authority is doing the exact opposite. Just days before Mr. Abbas arrived at the White House, an op-ed piece appeared in the Washington Post with the headline, Palestinians are rewarding terrorists. The U.S. should stop enabling them. We should make economic aid contingent on an end to the bounty program. That op-ed was written by Thane Rosenbaum, who, of course, many of you well know from his frequent appearances on JBS, including his sitting beside me for roundtables and JBS specials. Thane is a distinguished fellow at NYU Law School. He's the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, and he's an award-winning novelist. And Thane joins us on our JBS phones now. Thane, thank you so much, and congratulations for writing a courageous an important piece in the Washington Post. Thank you, Mark. Thane, how did your op-ed come about? Did you propose the piece, or did the Washington Post approach, approach you? Well, you know, when it comes to uh, pro-Israel or anti-Palestinian uh, articles in mainstream media, uh, the, 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 the editors there are rarely soliciting these kinds of articles. Uh, anything that ever makes Palestinians uh, look bad are not articles that are uh, in the minds of editors at any of these major newspapers. So, no, I, I presented, I proposed it to them, um, and I, I must give credit to Sander Gerber. I don't know, he's a, a, a Jewish philanthropist and, and politically minded uh, Jewish man who lives in New York. But he he has been on a crusade about this issue 
uh, for about a year. Uh, you know, since Taylor Force was murdered and Taylor Force's family, I guess we can talk a little about that, got involved with some senators to try to pass this legislation. Uh, the idea of, you know, innocent civilians, tourists, Israelis, uh, walking around and being stabbed or mowed down by a, a car, uh, the kind of incitement that we're seeing more and more in what's now being called the stabbing intifada, and if you heard that term of art, the third intifada called the stabbing intifada. Uh, he was the one that said, look, you know, th- we're helping to fund this. Uh, and so, you know, I saw some of the uh, essays that had been written in other uh, Jewish uh, papers, uh, and there was a congressional report that was submitted about these payments. And I called the Washington Post, and I said, you know, here's a, here's a really great story in advance of Abbas's mission. And it's an important question. Uh, how could there possibly be peace in the Middle East if he's been promoting terrorism by paying salaries to terrorists? And rewarding terrorists, the, the more violent the crime, the more salaries they receive. And in fact, the most violent crimes that receive jail sentences of 25 years or more, or 30 years or more, receive a $25,000 cash bonus. It is astounding. By the way, was the piece difficult for you to write? No, I mean, it was difficult to restrain myself, and that's why if you see the essay in the Washington Post... I was very lawyerly in laying out the legislation because it's almost surreal to think about how openly, uh, how above board and openly this practice takes place. Uh, It's codified in Palestinian West Bank law. Uh, There are several different pieces of legislation that contemplate two different kinds of committees, uh, groups, foundations. One is a foundation set up for the martyrs who commit crimes commit acts of terror against Israelis. And the other is for their families, to take care of the families. And so this thing comes with tuition payments, with life insurance payments, uh, with health care, pensions, monthly salaries, bonuses. And if you're a man who's been in jail for five years or more, or a woman for two years or more, you get these payments for life. Thane, you not only describe this so beautifully in your piece, there's a reason you wanted both Americans and you wanted the administration to read it. What was your goal? Well, you know, the, this is an ongoing problem that you know I've talked about on your show for many years, and I've written about as well. Uh, the Palestinians are simply not held accountable for their own moral uh, depravity, their own political blunders, uh, we just, we infantilize them. Uh, the burden is all placed on Israel, and we treat the Palestinians as if they have no reason to be held accountable for anything, as if they have no impulse control, like children. and We couldn't possibly stop them from stabbing or killing. And so, as you know, I've been consistent for years in calling attention to Palestinian complicity in their own, problem, in their own problems, the situation that they've made worse, and the moral universe that they operate under that really receives no critical judgment in the West. Um, By the way, I don't know if you saw in today's paper, Abbas was literally said uh, in his own language to speaking to Palestinians that in referring to the request, Trump's request to end the salaries and the incitement, he said, quote, the president is mad, close quote, like crazy. You know, Palestinians think it's totally normal and legitimate. If you kill a Jew, you should get paid for it. Mm -hmm. Of course, naturally. Mm -hmm. You kill a Jew or anyone standing next to a Jew, you're a martyr. And if you're in jail or if you were shot, your families should benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Actually, the best job you can get in the West Bank is to kill an Israeli. In many cases, it's 20 times the average income of a West Bank resident you could receive if you simply kill somebody. And I think it's important to continue to put the pressure and to shine the light on the fact that Palestinians are not ready for statehood, and they haven't shown themselves to be statesmen. They are far more interested in, in violence and terror and ending and destroying the Jewish state than they are in building a Palestinian one. And so it's really a charade. 
to talk about, you know, Palestinian statehood. Palestine right now, whatever you call it, is a failed state. Uh, they just simply, you know, they have a president who was elected eight years ago to a four-year term. <laughs> Sorry, it's too funny. You know, this, this is not a democracy. They're, they're, they're not ready for anything, and they're not demonstrating. And they're, they're in fact, it's worse. They're perpetuating a culture of, of bloodlust and, and violence against Israel. And how could they possibly call themselves peacemakers? Is if, oh, there's another piece to this, Mark, that was in the essay. If you commit a crime like this, it's not just the salary that you receive. You're guaranteed a high-ranking civil service appointment once you're released from jail. Yes. I mean, that to me, is, it, it, that means that the entire civil society that works in the Palestinian Authority, they're all former terrorists. The higher up they are, the, the, the rank that they received, they achieved because they committed a much more violent crime. Yes. Now, how, how in the world can the Israelis actually believe that peace is possible when the entire civil service is made up of murderers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the title you... I don't know whether you created the title. No, they, they wrote oh, that. Yeah. The newspaper always creates the title. But the title was, the uh, part of the title is, the U.S. should stop enabling them, meaning Palestinians, and that we should make economic aid contingent on an end to the bounty program. I thought in part, Thane, you were writing this to the administration, that you hoped that whether it was Donald Trump personally or people around Donald Trump, that obviously they read the Washington Post every day. They're going to see your piece. And my own feeling was, you know, maybe before Donald Trump sits down with Mahmoud Abbas, somebody's going to bring this to his attention and maybe it will move things forward. Was that in any way in your mind? It is in my mind, but I'm much more cynical about that. You know, there is, there is such pressure around the world to help the poor, poor Palestinians. It's always the poor, poor Palestinians. And the idea of not helping them, of not giving them aid, is, seems like morally unconscionable in our world. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever asks questions. Like, just like we, you know, I wrote an essay recently for the Alga Miner about all the money the United States gives to the U.N. And no one asks the question, what does the United States get out of the U.N. other than Israel bashing? What is, what is the United States getting out of it? It's a similar question. The, the United States gives $400 million a year to the Palestinian Authority in aid. $400 million a year. Now, last year, uh, the Palestinians paid out $150 million to terrorist, terrorist salaries for those who committed crimes. Uh, the Taylor Force Act, which is now before Congress, the idea is to have a dollar a dollar for reduction for every dollar that's given to a terrorist or his or her family as a reward for committing terrorism that dollar should be deducted from the amount of aid and it could end up that the total number is around between 350 and 400 million between money given to terrorists and money given to for families so that it would be a total wash the 400 million that the United States would give would be canceled out by the four hundred million dollars that the Palestinian gives, Palestinian Authority gives out to families and terrorists. Um, uh, you know, there's no question that American tax dollars are supporting uh, these payments, because while over a hundred million dollars are go goes to infrastructure things like sanitation and water, some of it just goes to the general budgetary needs of the Palestinian Authority which means it's being commingled. The dollars that we're giving is being commingled with other budgetary items that are being used to pay salary. Yes, and by the way, Thane, you point out money is fungible. Fungible. So even if money is being used for sanitation, right. right, and that's where our money is going, it means that other money is now being freed up to pay terrorists. So exactly. either way, we are helping them. But at the same time, Mark, I just can't imagine you know, the United States actually saying, that's it. You know, we, we, the idea of the Palestinians needing help either through UNRWA, I mean, this is a perpetual re refugee crisis situation. 
They are the only refugees, I, I think many of your people know, JBS viewers know, Palestinians are the only refugees in the world that have their own refugee agency. That's right. Every other people on the planet have a different refugee agency. The Palestinians have one that's called UNRWA. Everyone else is required to be a refugee for only one generation. That's it. You're not allowed to go on. The Palestinians can be perpetual refugees forever. Now, does that make sense to anybody? Why is it that these are the only people in the world that can sit in refugee camps and claim refugee status, and every other people on Earth are required to integrate into another society? Yes. Um, so the point is, the well, United States gives money to UNRWA also, right? And I, I, that, as far as I'm concerned, nothing does more to perpetuate a culture of, of, of non-action, of, of not statehood, uh, a culture of dependency, than continuing to give money to UNRWA. The right. more money that UNRWA gets, the more Palestinians can, can, can cozy in sure. to this perpetual status of dependency. Yes, it is instead tragic. Of, it, instead of requiring yes. them to say, no, you have to do what every other refugee... You know, I, I just did, recently did a, a, a talk at a synagogue in Florida, and I asked the audience, I said, does anyone know where 19 Valova Street is? And nobody knew. I said, you don't know where 19 Volova Street is? And everyone looked around, and I said, of course you don't know what it is. It's actually my family's home in Rodham, Poland. This was more my father and grandfather. My father grew up, and my grandfather had a house still there in Rodham, Poland. It never occurred to my parents when they moved to the United States after the Holocaust that they should sit in a refugee camp for the rest of their lives with their son for the rest of their lives, holding on to the key for 19 Volova Street. <laughs> It never occurred to us. Only Palestinians think that they are entitled to the exact olive tree that they lost. That's it. No other one. That's the only one that can be achieved. So what I'm saying is, yes, I wanted the administration to, to read what I wrote, but I'm too cynical to think that they're going to do what's necessary. Uh, what's necessary is to cut them off, cut them off at the knees. No money, zero money. If you're serious about having a state, then you can't be serious about killing Israelis. Yes, you say that's, it. You say you say it beautifully, Thane Bowie. I have to tell you, I thought your piece was superbly written. The point you were making was clear. It's ethical, moral. It's even righteous. No government should be giving incentives to murder civilians, even if those civilians are a part of the enemy. But Thane. Then I read the comments that were published under your piece <laughs> by the Washington Post. Thane, I was flabbergasted yeah. at the I, venom, I, hold on, and the hatred. And I want to show our audience good. just a few of the comments. By the way, there are virtually 1,000 comments posted by the Washington Post beneath Thane's column. I want you just to see a few of them. Here's one. The idea that the West Bank is the, quote, ancestral homeland of European Jews is, I think he meant, visible nonsense. The homeland of the European Jews is actually northern Italy. Number two, why do you think that the Washington Post would publish a one-sided, inaccurate, dishonest piece like this from a known bigot and racist like Rosenbaum who has demonstrated that he is in favor of apartheid or even genocide in Palestine. Thane, <laughs> this is what this is what your piece evoked. You favor apartheid, genocide. You wrote it one sided, inaccurate piece and I'm saying to myself, boy, people are going to read Thane's piece, and he's going to convince everyone. And then I read these comments. Now, you read them also, Thane. What was your personal reaction? Well, Mark, I don't ever read those for that reason. In fact, I always tell my children not to read them. It bothers them. And I, I just said, look, you know, it's just, a, you know, when on, online is, a, is an anti-Semitism convention. You know, that's the Internet. The Internet is a, it's a, it's a great opportunity for anti-Semitism to flourish because nobody's even showing their own name. It's anonymous anti-Semitism. Um, 
Well, I know I'm not surprised to hear what you said, uh, but I, I never read that. I know that anything I write in the mainstream press is going to elicit that kind of venom. I know it, and I, and I never, I never, even, I never doubt it for a second. Okay, um, Faye, we've but it talked. It demonstrates again, you know, what a a bubble, you know, you know, Jews that love Israel are in, yes. you know, because the, you know, this is the street. <laughs> This is what the street thinks. This is what comes out on the street, um, and uh, and you know I'm 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 not surprised by it. I uh, by the way, you know, as for genocide, <laughs> this is the thing I always love to say publicly. Do you know that the Palestinian population has doubled, more than doubled, since the occupation? In quotes, right. So the next time someone uses the word genocide of the Palestinians. They'd ask them, what genocide have you ever heard of when the population actually doubled? Mm-hmm. Genocide is a subtraction. It's mm-hmm. not multiplication. Mm-hmm. In order to throw you genocide, there have to be fewer Palestinians. It can't be twice as many. Okay. Thane, there is something noble in a president saying that he wants to be a mediator, an arbiter, a facilitator of a peace between... Israelis and Palestinians. What was your reaction when you heard President Trump say he wants to be just that and that peace may not be as hard to achieve as people think? Well, it's not the first time the president has spoken out openly and done so in a way that, you know, demonstrates how ill-informed he is. Uh, He may be sincere about this, but the idea that, you know, Jared Kushner is the answer or the idea that this could be more simple than people have believed, is obviously, you know, doesn't know anything about the Middle East. The, 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 the bounty system alone is uh, an, uh, an immediate demonstration that the Palestinians are not ready for statehood. Uh, the new Hamas charter, which is really a variation of the old Hamas charter, where the issue really is about Jewish existence in the Middle East, that's really the problem. It's not about territory. Territory, was, it would be great if it could only be about territory. It's really about the Jewish presence uh, and the Middle East, and worse, Jewish statehood. It drives the Arab world crazy to think that Jews have been this successful in that spot. When you're looking at all of the failed states that exist in the Middle East and Israel as a beacon of democracy and world pro- progress and technology, I mean, it's, it's so, I, you know, look, I, I, I applaud the president's uh, optimism, but anybody who's really been watching this, uh, and by the way, you know, I mean, I'm not sure Bibi Netanyahu is a ready as a peacemaker for many reasons, but one of the reasons is because, you know, he doesn't know he has a partner for peace. Uh, Abbas is clearly a weak leader. Uh, he has no control over Gaza. Um, I mean, who's our partner? Uh, and the partner is the guy, Abbas, who said that Trump was mad if he thinks that the Palestinians are going to give up their salary bounty system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how, if that's his takeaway, if the president of the Palestinian Authority walked away from uh, 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 Trump's sincere, albeit naive, speech and said the president is a lunatic because he doesn't understand the, the justification for killing innocent civilians who are Israelis, then, then where is the peace? How is that going to work? Mm-hmm. I mean, I would say that the fact that Abbas was not ready to abandon the bounty system is Exhibit A, right there. It's not going to work. That's not a peacemaker. That's not a partner for peace. That is not a demonstration of a people ready for statehood who really want statehood. You know, I, I pointed out in a recent essay that had, uh, had Arafat accepted the deal that Clinton and Ehud Barak had presented in the year 2000, Palestine today as a country would be 17 years old. What a waste. 17 years of killing, and what did they get out of that? Mm-hmm. And the only thing they get out of that is that they believe that, they, that time is always on their side. Yes. Because they see... Only one solution, a Jewless Middle East. Yes. Anything other than a Jewless Middle East is a failure to them, mm-hmm. and they will wait for as long as necessary. Okay. You've heard me ask this question before. 
I've even asked you, but I want to hear what your answer is at this moment in time. It is so obvious to me what you are saying. I believe you are describing what everyone sees. So why do we have an American administration that doesn't seem to see it? Is this all a charade? They really do see it, but they feel they can't say it out loud. Or, Thane, is there a reason why administration after administration after administration doesn't simply say to the Palestinians, you either shape up, you cut the violence, you cut the incitement, you take off Palestinian Authority TV, teaching little kids how to stab Jews. You're going to accept the fact that there's going to be a Jewish state living next to you. You're going to call it a Jewish state. You're going to embrace its reality. And then we'll all, including Israel, will all help you create a viable working state of your own. I want to know what Thane Rosenbaum's answer is to himself, why we never hear that out of an American administration. Well, I love the way you described it, Mark. It was beautiful. It's perfect. Um, that is called reading the riot act to the Palestinians. Um, but no one's going to say that. The only person that I thought might say it would be Trump. Yes. Uh, because he's not a diplomat. Yes. Uh, because he doesn't have social graces. Yes. Because he doesn't believe in babying people. Right. You know, Obama was, President Obama was a proceduralist. You know, in every way, it was, you know, he, he took his law degree seriously, and he was a proceduralist, too much so. Uh, but, you know, this is a guy, Trump, who says, he, I, you know, he tweets whatever's on his mind, right? So you'd think he would take what Mark Golub just said and repeat it, say, look, this is a very good, you know, it would be a good stump speech, deliver this to them. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if uh, Trump was capable or willing to say this in private. I think this is what's required. Um, I don't think that's not what's been said yet. I do think that Trump has the hubris of a guy who said, he said the other day, he said, everybody says that this is the biggest deal that you know, could never get made, and I think I could make it, right? Yeah. So he, he's sort of trying to say, look, no one could pull this off except someone like me, a, a masterful deal maker. You know, if, if he had a better understanding of the dynamics, in the Middle East, maybe. Um, but I don't think he's fully aware of the level of complexity and what really needs to happen. Look, Israel needs to make concessions, too. As you know, I've been hard on Israel also throughout my professional career, much less so over the last number of years because it became an unfair fight, and I wasn't willing to, to, to do that anymore. Um, but the, tough, the, the kinds of tough talk words the Palestinians, as I said before, it's not going to happen because we have a narrative. The narrative is, your listeners will hear it, the poor, poor Palestinians. Everybody repeat after me. The poor, poor Palestinians. That's how the majority of the world refers to them. Um, I just wrote an essay. Forgive me, Thane. Yeah. I have to cut you off only because of the clock. Ah. Thane, you, say it, you always say it so wonderfully. I'm always thrilled when you're on JBS. You stay well, you keep writing, and you and I will sit together very, very soon. Well, what you're doing there is a, an incredible accomplishment at JBS TV, and I know your viewers are very grateful to you. Thank you, my I. friend. Thank you. Okay. The thoughts of Thane Rosenbaum, distinguished fellow at NYU Law School. He's the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society. He's an award-winning novelist. He wrote a fabulous op-ed piece. I only wish it resonated throughout the administration and throughout the world. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editors, Dennis Golan and John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Mm -hmm.